one. 601 How Firm a Foundation Takes 601 Standing As We Say. Sunday, and Lord, we pray that you'd be honored and glorified in this place. May you be pleased with our singing, with our offering, and Lord, with our attention to your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would have your will and way in each heart and life today. We pray for the defeat of Satan, plead the blood of Christ upon the service. Thank you for the Downs family being with us today and this week, and we pray the rich blessing and anointing on Brother Downs as he delivers the message this morning. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. We'll enjoy our choir special.
span, turn to page 515. 515, near the cross. Page 515, standing as we sing. Sunday school hour was certainly a, a very edifying and encouraging and Amen. challenging, and we're grateful for that. And looking forward to Brother Downs preaching for us this morning as well as tonight in our 6 p.m. service. And then after the service tonight, we'll we'll have our BLT fellowship back back in the fellowship hall. So we'll enjoy that time. Of course, if you are one that volunteered to uh, fry, bake, or however you're going to cook the bacon, make sure you get that done and bring that with you tonight for the evening service. We appreciate the college and career class uh, organizing that for us this evening and then this week Monday Tuesday and Wednesday mornings Brother Downs will be speaking to our school students so if you're a homeschool family and would like to to uh, participate in that the chapel will be at 825 in the morning that's uh, all school chapel and then at 11 a.m. there'll be a, a time that's tomorrow and then at 11 a.m. be a time for the junior high and high school so again, if you're a homeschool family and like to participate in that, we invite you to be here uh, with us on Monday and Tuesday and uh, for that, that time together. And then Brother Downs, again, will be preaching this Wednesday also. So we're excited about uh, that uh, kickoff conference for our school. And, and of course, we began classes on Thursday. 
thanks me for praying about that. The Lord blessed us with good first few days of school. I was just thinking about how I would share that with you, and I can uh, assure you no one's failing yet. <laughs> we're off to a great start, right? Sure. Yeah. Staff and students, by the way, we're all doing great. So praise the Lord for that. So we're excited about the school year, and we're looking forward to a wonderful conference this week. Uh, ladies, remember to get signed up for the Ladies Conference, which is September the 9th and 10th, all right? Friday and Saturday, September 9th and 10th. The sign-up sheet for that is on the bulletin board between the buildings there in the hallway. So go ahead and get signed up. The cost is $30. Registration cost is $30. Well worth every dollar. Uh, and that will include uh, lunch and as well as some other things. But uh, if you'll get signed up for that, you'll need to pay the $30 today. You know, that'll be due, I think, the end of the month. Is that right? End of August. But if you please, if you know you're coming, get signed up because they're making purchases. And we have, I think we're up to five or six area churches that are going to be joining us for our ladies' conference this year. And so ladies, you want to get signed up for that. September the 9th and 10th, and there are some other uh, special dates in there in the bulletin for you, work days and things that are on the on the horizon there. And then men, we're also going to have our retreat this year over in Indianapolis. That's the middle of October. Those dates are in the bulletin, so please uh, mark those on your calendar if you would. And let's participate in everything we can uh, at this week. So let me clarify something. Sometimes it's a question because we have the kickoff conference in the bulletin. We, we might think we have services in the evenings. There aren't any special services for the church family on Monday or Tuesday night. Brother Downs will be preaching our regular services today and then, then Wednesday night. So hope that's clear for you. If you have a device with you, please make sure that it's on um, airplane mode so it won't be a distraction in the service today. All right, my dad will come and he'll receive our offering this morning. Wow, good to be here. What a blessing to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You know, I'm kind of a history buff. I like history. I've got a, I found an old book. I, I had it in my library, I just didn't know I had it, one of those deals, and I looked at it and it said, you know, one of the, this day in history deal. And so uh, I look at it today, it said August 21st, and it said, uh, in 1959, Hawaii became a state. I thought, that's history? 1959, how many of you remember that? And they had to change, yeah, they had to change the flag. I thought, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. That, that's kind of what I'm saying. And uh, uh, life, life's so good. I, I remember, you know, it, that Hawaii's our fiftieth state, and uh, not, no one cares. But, uh, but uh, I, I remember as a kid. Uh, look, we got fifty states now. It was all even, you know. That other throw, you can do that. It was all even. I mean, uh, Good, let's have our ushers come. I didn't tell a stupid joke this morning, aren't you glad? <laughs> Pastor Brown, you thank the Lord, please. All right, Adam, do you thank the Lord uh, for this day that you gave us, Lord, and uh, bring us here all here today for what you're from you. Lord, you ask that you be blessed to give us today.
morning. We're grateful to have the Downs with us. They're not strangers to our church, but they may be new to you. And so we're uh, thankful for their ministry here for many years now. It's been coming uh, this time of year for, for quite some time, uh, except for COVID season. We had to adjust some things, but we're grateful for them. Brother, Brother Matt serves uh, at the Bill Rice Ranch. I don't know what his official title is, but it is whatever needs to be done. Ask Brother Matt about it. That's the job description, right? Something like that. Is it camp director? Is that your title? All right. He's, he directs the camp there at the ranch. And, of course, a uh, good preacher, and we're grateful for his ministry to us. We've been privileged to, to be going to the ranch now, I think, for 30-plus years, and we're thankful for their history and the way they complement uh, philosophy of ministry here. And so thankful for that. Of course, we've got some of our kids that are now kids. They're not kids. They're young adults uh, attending the college there and, and growing and, and uh, benefiting from that. So thankful for them and looking forward to what God has for us in the morning service today. So Brother Downs, you come and preach to us. James chapter number one. James chapter number one, and we'll find verse number 22 by way of introduction. James chapter number one and verse number 22. A lot of you all were here for Sunday school, but I uh, just want to say again, we're thrilled to be here. We're looking excited for the week and all that entails. Appreciate Pastor uh, letting us come back again. And I uh, felt like something was missing last year, you know, and uh, we're glad to be able to be back here again. James chapter number one. If you haven't, why don't we go ahead and stand out of respect of God's word and we'll go ahead and get going this morning. James 1 and verse number 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The title of the message this morning is a doer of the word. Let's pray and ask the word out. us. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And I'm just so thankful about how it easily applies to our life. Lord, if we find ourselves lacking in an area, as we're taking a look at the mirror of your word today, Lord, I pray that we'll confess it and forsake it and draw closer to you. Lord, I need your help. Fill me with the Spirit's power. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. I think we're standing. You may take your seat. As we find here in the book of James, it's a very practical book. And it's talking about the last verses that we read of a man beholding his face in a glass or in a mirror and seeing that there's probably some things he needs to take care of and then walketh away and doesn't take care of those problems. Now, I have this conversation as a camp director to young men often. I'll say something to something like this to this effect to the, our young men living in the Paul Levine building. When was the last time you looked in a mirror? And oftentimes, if I'm asking a young man that question, I get a lot of jargon. <laughs> something like that. Have you ever talked to a teenager before? Oftentimes I'm having this conversation, you know, before 7 a.m. So it's hard for them to talk. It's hard for them to function. It's hard for them, apparently, to look in a mirror. And I've had conversations with these young men, and they'll quickly answer back, because we've already had this conversation before. I'll say, hey, did you look in a mirror today? They'll say, yes, sir. So I'll ask them this next question. Did you do anything about it? 
No, sir. <laughs> go to the restroom and go take care of that problem. And then they'll come back, whoa, it was pretty bad today. It wasn't really bad. <laughs> yes, yes. I guess I have worn that shirt for a while. Yes, yes, you have. I guess I needed to comb those hairs. Yes, yes, you did. I needed to shave. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. And so there's different things like that that would come up uh, from time to time. Well, I remember as a kid when I first started having mirrors become important to me. You know, you start liking yourself a little bit more. You're, you find yourself impressed by what you're looking at in the mirror, right? And so I, I remember as a kid, I'd get my dad's old Chevy truck and, I, and uh, we'd be driving down the road and I noticed I could see myself in the side mirror of the truck. And uh, you know, I'd look, you know, make sure everything was doing well. And uh, my dad would say something like this, hey boy, you like yourself? <laughs> well, I was always immediately embarrassed if dad said that, you know, because he caught me looking. Well, I think oftentimes, uh, really, especially as we're growing older in life, it's a little bit easier. We're always evaluating ourselves, making sure we're looking uh, better, or we try to make ourselves look younger, or we say, wow, I've lost all hope. You know, different things like that as we're looking in the mirror, but we're trying to do something to make ourselves look a little bit better. Um, it's, it becomes more and more rare, especially I think as you get older that you look in the mirror and you're like, whatever. But we have days like that, do we not? This is just as good as it gets. Well, I think oftentimes as a Christian, we go to the mirror of the Word of God. And if we're paying attention to what we're reading, we can become convicted on what we read. And as we become convicted on what we read, we're like, yeah, I have that. But you know what? So and so is worse. Yeah, I've got these issues, Lord. But remember about so and so. As you're looking in a mirror, it's not about how so and so looks. It's about how you're looking and how you are looking to God. Right. So it's very convicting, especially when you get in the book of James when it's a really practical book. And you're like, oh, yeah, I think I'm doing pretty well. Then you start reading some things and you think to yourself, ouch, <laughs> I've got some blemishes. I've got sin in my life that I need to take care of so that I can be a doer of the word. Well, that's something that's important to me, and I think it's important to you, that we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. And so as we take a look at the mirror of the word of God this morning, it does some of these things for us. Number one, it evaluates how you're doing. So as you're getting into the word of God and you're reading the word of God, it's giving you an evaluation on how you're doing. I don't know if you like job evaluations. Oh, that's always a dreaded time. Uh, I'm sure when somebody's going to tell you, let me tell you how you really are doing your work. That's always a blessing. And um, I remember a teacher in Bible college. He was freaked out about teacher evaluation forms. So when you first got to Bible college, the first week of classes, he's talking about teacher evaluation forms. And so you think about that, you're really like, you can become nervous and different things. But quite frankly, it's a help. As you go to the mirror of the Word of God, it's evaluating how you're doing. It's evaluating how you're doing, number one, during trials. It evaluates how you're doing during trials. Look at James 1 and look at verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That phrase, where the Bible says, count it all joy. Pastor Redwood explained that phrase in one of the sermons many years ago, I heard. That was a help to me. My brethren, count it all joy, or welcome as a friend when trials come. How do you welcome trials. Well, quite frankly, in my flesh, I do not welcome trials. I hate them. <laughs> if, if I would have wanted to pick, Matt, you want to go through a trial today? Let me be honest with you. No! <laughs> I don't want a trial. I, I want to have a good time. I want my life to be easy. Isn't that sort of selfish? Yes! <laughs> but if you're just going to ask me in my flesh, I don't want a trial. I hate trials. I don't like them. 
The Bible says this. Welcome him as a friend. You know, as a man, as you read welcome as a friend, that maybe doesn't mean a whole lot to us because you know how you welcome a friend? Guy versus guy, you, have you ever evaluated that before? You know, whether it's been a week or up to a decade. Hey, hey. That's how we welcome each other. Now, there's some more emotional people that when they welcome as friends, it's a little different. But, like, uh, I haven't seen Pastor Brent. Oh, it's been long. It's been several months now I haven't seen Pastor Brent. At least a couple. Maybe one. Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of love as I came in. It was, hey, this is where we're parking. Don't take up too many spots. <laughs> That's Pastor Brent. Welcome me as a friend. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I was like, I thought he was going to give me a ticket because I was in the handicap parking. You know, I got no idea. <laughs> but we know Pastor Brent. He gets to the point. I said, hey. He said, hey, park here. I said, fine. Don't run into the church. Okay. And we got going. Hey, it's going to rain. Hey, no, it's not. That was our conversations. Right? And that's sort of how we are. I worked with Pastor Brent at the ranch. It was a good time. I see him here each year when I come. It's great. But that's how we talk to each other. Hey, hey, my house stay good? Of course. You know, those kind of things. <laughs> I like bacon. Okay. <laughs> so we have those conversations. But there's never a, like, big, dramatic welcoming. <clears throat> okay? Have you ever seen ladies not see each other for a while? And some ladies, they just can't help it, whether it's been a week or a month or a decade, it's the same reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of fun to watch, you know, because men were just not wired that way. And uh, there can be screaming, there can be crying and weeping and gnashing of teeth and all these things. And they're just so excited about seeing each other. There's hugging and all those things. If Pastor Brent would do that to me, we'd have some problems. Right? Because they're like, hey, 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 there, hey, go. Oh. All right. That's how guys are wired. However you're wired, we're going to face trials. And they're going to keep on coming. And they're not going to stop coming until we get to glory. That's right. So we know they're coming. It shouldn't be a shocker. If everyone's like, oh, everything's going great. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Something's coming up. What is it? I don't know, but it's coming. And then you get it. Maybe it's one you had before. That's always nice. Because you have some type of way to get through it, you think. Then there's new stuff. You know, if you need new trials, have children. No. And I'm amazed that my children go through trials that I've never had to go through before. And I'm like, wow, this is a whole new trial. What is that? Or uh, they could get sick in different ways. I've never heard of before. Become a father. Trials. Right? Become a camp director. Trials. <laughs> Become a pastor. Smooth. <laughs> so I understand the right. <laughs> Almost like an angel. Yes. <laughs> so how are we supposed to deal with these trials? James tells us. Welcome as a friend. Hello, trial. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> You're back. Thank you, thorn in the flesh. I mean, don't call people that, but we know trials are going to keep on coming. So we get the word of God and evaluates how we're dealing with those trials. Uh, we deal with temptations. Look at verse number 12. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted. When he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In verse 15, you find the sin cycle. Lust, the desire to do wrong. And it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. We all are tempted. 
I remember thinking as a kid, that person probably never gets tempted. Just looking at different pastors and different evangelists that would come through. Man, it must be nice. Those guys never get tempted by anything anymore. You know, I realized something. That's not true. That's right, that's right. We are tempted all of our days continually. Right. Now, some of us, we are tempted more than others because you're setting yourself up for the temptation. You know you have a problem at looking at things you're not supposed to, but you keep going back to the internet and setting yourself up for problems. So oftentimes, because of our own flesh, we set ourselves up to be tempted. Anytime this happens, I always just blow a gasket every time I go there. Well, why do you keep going there? I, I remember when I was in Bible college and the pastor at the time was Pastor Shetler. And there was a billboard and the billboard was showcasing an immodest lady about a restaurant. And he was in ministerial class. And he said, I go the same way of work for how many years now? He goes, fellas, I don't go the same way anymore. And you know why? It's because of that raunchy billboard. Well, that's just practical stuff. But it stuck with me. If I'm getting tempted because of a raunchy billboard, or listen, I could be tempted. Me being right with the Lord is more important than my schedule and my route. And us guys, we like our schedule. We like our route. We like our same coffee cup. Why are we that way? I have no idea. But the older we get, we get more annoying that way. Do we not? <laughs> we know what we like. That's what we want. But you know what? Even though you like your schedule and you like your route, it's more important to be right with God. Amen. And say, you know what? I'm not going that way. Amen. And he said, fellas, let's pray that God takes it down. And uh, eventually it did. We praised the Lord over that and got his route back. <laughs> Somebody had to tell him, though, because he wasn't going that way. I don't want to be the guy that had to tell him. But anyway. <laughs> So uh, the Bible evaluates how we're doing during trials and during temptation. Now, this is my encouraging part of the sermon. Hopefully it all is, but good news when we're going through trials and temptations. God promises to give us help. That's right. Now, that's awesome. And that's what I need. Because if you're talking to me about trials and temptations, uh, based upon that thou strength, it's over. But I have God that wants to help me. And it's found in verse number 5 in verse chapter 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. That is awesome. Have you ever gone through a trial and you thought to yourself, I have absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do? Have you gone through a temptation and you're like, I can't get rid of it? Hello, look at verse number five. God will give us help. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. It's a promise of God that we have in verse number five. He will give you the wisdom to get through that trial and through that temptation. But we're not going to God. And we're not asking God. You show me a person that doesn't know what to do, and my first question that I'm asking them, have you talked to God about it? Because God promises to give it to all men liberally. What a great God that we serve. So if you're in the word of God, it's evaluating how you're doing. Secondly, it educates us or gives instruction to us on how to live. The Bible educates us on how we're supposed to live. Gives a couple examples here in the book of James. One, how do you treat people that are less fortunate than you? How do you treat people that are less fortunate to you? Look at James 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So here's an example 
of people that has gone through a hard time. Someone that lost their father or someone that's lost their husband. Now, back in Bible times, if that would happen, it's a terrible blow. It's always going to be a terrible blow, but even more so back in those times because it was hard for ladies to work and get money and, and different things like that. And uh, I know how to lose a father. That's happened to me. I was 11 years old when I lost my dad. And my mom became a widow. And I watched how God worked. And it was something. You know, in my mind, as an 11-year-old or going through my teen years, I was, going to, I was asking God for help. I was asking God help from a father. And, and I thought really what I needed was one guy to sort of put me under his wing and to teach me stuff and to say, hey, don't be doing that. You should be doing this, that kind of thing. And, and I thought God would raise up one man. My mom would pray the same way if you would ask her today, that God would raise up one man. Well, God didn't raise up one man to be my father figure. God gave me a church. Amen. God gave me a church. Amen. So there were times when I needed different men at different times in my life. And I had a mom, even though who was going through a hard time and was a widow, she said, no matter what we're going through, we're going to church no matter what. Now, I commend my mom because I think that was a hard deal. And if I had time or I was able to give you the whole story about it, you'd be like, yeah, that would be a really hard deal. Because there were things that messed with the church. We had to, after dad died, we had to go to a different church. And we were in a whole new situation. And what are we going to do? Well, the church that we were in is the church that God wanted us in. And they just absorbed us and they just loved on us. And there are some men that loved on me. And there are some men that put me aside and said, go, straighten up. And you know what? I needed that. Now, I'm so thankful that God raised up Pastor Combs and the people of Life and Bible Baptist Church to be a help to me. That's the way God intended to help people through his church. Now, my mom had needs. My mom needed help. And what she did was just stay faithful to church, and God supplied all of our needs. So how do you treat people that are less fortunate to you? If they're less fortunate than you, you need to help out. If God's giving you the burden to help someone that's fatherless, if God's giving you the burden to help out the widow, and I'm telling you something, do that, and God will bless you for it. And I would say you do that through church. That's the best way. It goes on in James chapter number two. It not only talks about fatherless and widows, but it also talks specifically about people that are poor. It says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel. And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. And we have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, or simply nice clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not, the, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? And so the Bible goes on about this. In verse number 9 it says, But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So how do you treat people that are less fortunate to you than you? How do you treat people that aren't dressed like how you're dressed? Or look the way you look? or act the way you act. You know, if they're walking in the church building, they should not see a respect of persons here. Right. Right. They should see people that love each other, that want to help each other. Yeah. So how do you treat people? Sometimes in churches, even this side can have respect of persons to people on the other side. 
We've been in that. Uh, we've been in situations where certain families are in the church. And there's several. You know, there's second and third cousins. You're related, you're related, you're related. And if you're not part of the family, then, okay, you're sort of, uh, you can come, but as long as you sit in the back left. You know, that kind of thing. And uh, sometimes we get into farm communities where everybody knows each other and they know where the score was that happened 50 years ago and who to talk to, who not to talk to, and all those kinds of things. Listen, we should be able to love each other. Yeah. We should be able to get along with each other. It, it shouldn't be about what job you have or how you're dressed or what kind of car you drive when it comes to the things of God. That's right. We should be able to love on each other. So how do you treat people that are less fortunate than you. It goes on about this education that we're getting here in James. It's not only how do you treat people less fortunate, but how do you use your tongue? How do you use your tongue? What do you talk about and how do you speak? Look at James 1 and verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religious religion is vain. If you can't control your tongue, you are a fake, is what God's Word says. You'd say, hey, no, 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 come on now, that's my personality. No, it's not a personality. I can understand you have more of a problem than maybe somebody else does. I get it, we all have our weaknesses. But if you can't control what comes out of your mouth, you are a fake and you are a phony. And you're not living for God like you should. Some of us, when it comes down to speaking, where speaking is okay, but what do you text about? How do you update your status about? There's a lot of mean people behind computer screens nowadays. How are you controlling your tongue? The words that are coming out. Let me hear how you speak, and I can tell you the direction you're going in. Look at James chapter 3. James 3, verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For if any things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great, they're driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know you can get on a horse. I don't get on a horse very often. Uh, typically I get on once a year. But I missed my chance this past year so it's been a couple years I've been on a horse. And uh, so you get on a horse, and there's bits already put in the horse. And even though this horse is a lot more powerful than me, wherever I want that horse to go, do a little tug one way or the other, and that horse goes, do, 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 do. and I'm like, yeah, I'm controlling this horse. So is our tongue. Shows everybody else the route that we're on. He can control that big old ship with that helm. The tongue is controlling you. Or are you controlling your tongue? Don't be a flamethrower, is what I put down in verse number five. A little fire. You hold a fire, a little fire kindle just from your tongue. You just have to say it. You just got to put that little dig in. And because of that little dig, or because of that little text, because of that thing you said, we got a forest fire on our hands. That little spark that comes from the tongue. I remember I was in Bible college, and, and uh, it was probably, it was a very eventful devotional that I heard that day. And it was one of the ones I remember the most, but it probably wasn't the best one, if that makes sense. <laughs> so this one guy got up, and he was our chaplain, and never given really a devotional before, and he got voted in because everybody liked him. And uh, he got up in front of 100 guys, and he said, I have a twin brother, and we're identical. Well, that blew our mind that he had an identical twin. Because, you know, he was sort of an uh, interesting person. <laughs> and so because of that, we're like, whoa, you have a twin. You know, we started joking around about, hey, calm down, calm down, guys. Yes, I have an identical brother. And my mom always told us, never play with matches. I'm like, okay. 
yeah, that makes sense. Well, my mom went away one day, she went to the grocery store, and I started playing with matches with my brother. We lived in an apartment complex, and as we were playing with fire, we caught the curtains on fire. As we caught the curtains on fire, the whole apartment started catching on fire. We ran out of the apartment complex and we burned the apartment complex to the ground. As that fire was burning down that apartment complex, that's how you should have the fire of God in your life. <laughs> Let's pray. Well, I don't know if any of us prayed after that. We're like, <laughs> this dude just burned down an entire apartment complex and told us about it. We couldn't believe it. And he went and he sat down and we're like, was that true? Oh, yeah. Burned it all down? Yeah. Go far for God, guys. <laughs> I think there's probably a better way to say that. But the Bible says our tongue is a fire. We can start apartment complexes fire pretty quick. Just with our speech. As I was thinking about it, I was thinking about your tongue. And one more phrase I should probably say that I, you know, sometimes you just need to shut your yapper. That's what people need to hear. Shut your mouth. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say it. Oh, but with the internet and social media, we feel like we should say everything. We feel like we should give every opinion just because you think it doesn't mean you have to say it. Sometimes we're so quickly we're in our flesh and because of that we, we start a fire. So let's be a doer of the word. Number one, it evaluates how we're doing. Number two, it educates us on how to live. Number three, it emulates the Savior. If we're going to be a doer of the word, we need to emulate the Savior. Let me ask you this. Did the Lord Jesus go through temptations? He was on the earth. The answer is yes. How do you handle it? Perfectly. Right. Let me ask you this. Did the Lord Jesus go through trials? Yes. He went through a lot more that we don't even know about, I'm sure. But he went through all different types of trials. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they're always trying to trick him. He went all to different types of trials. How do you handle that? perfectly. Let me ask you this. Did the Lord Jesus tame his tongue? He sure did. You know, he's getting ready to go on the cross. They're beating him, plucking his beard out, all these things. The Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, so open he not his mouth. Now, that's against my nature. So if I'm right in a matter, the Lord Jesus is perfect in the matter. If I'm right in the matter and people are wronging me because I'm right, are you going to hear from me? Oh, yeah. You're going to hear a lot from me. Hey, I'm right. Hey, I didn't do anything wrong. You should stop this. All these things would be coming out of my mouth. But the Lord Jesus knew what he needed to do. He needed to die on the cross for mankind. Right. And he opened not his mouth. And he tamed his tongue. Let me ask you this. Did the Lord Jesus love on people that were less fortunate? Yeah. All over the place. Remember with Zacchaeus, they were upset. He's eating with a sinner! The Lord Jesus loves sinners. The Lord Jesus healed the sick. The Lord Jesus was raising people from the dead. He loved on everyone because everyone was less fortunate than him. He was God in flesh. So as we get into the word of God, we should be able to emulate our Savior. We can get through temptations. We can get through trials because God's given us help. We can tame our tongue and we can help out others through the grace of God that lives inside us. So let me ask you today, are you just going to be a hearer or a doer of the word? Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many of you would say, Brother Matt, 
God spoke in my heart today when talking about evaluate how we're doing. I'm going through some trials. I'm maybe going through some temptations. And I need to get help from God. God spoke in my heart about that. Would you please pray for me if that's you? Would you raise your hand? God bless you all. That's wonderful. God bless you all. Wonderful. You put your hands down. Let me encourage you today. He'll give you help. He promised. As we look at educating on how we're supposed to live, how are you treating people that are less fortunate? How are you using your time? And as we were getting that education this morning, you would say, God spoke in my heart. I need to maybe treat people better or I need to speak better. God spoke in my heart about that. Please pray for me. That's you. Would you raise your hand? God bless you all. Good. God bless you. Wonderful. You put your hands down. How many of you would say this? Brother Matt, I'm so thankful I have a relationship with God. That if I die today, I know for certain that I'm going to heaven. If you know that you're going to heaven, would you raise your hand? Wonderful. That's what I would expect. You put your hands down. But there may be others here today that you don't know. You don't know for certain if you're going to heaven or if you're going to hell. And you'd say, Brother Matt, would you please pray for me? I just don't know. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? I don't know. I don't know. All right, everyone, you can look up this way. If God spoke in your heart, I'm going to invite you to come down here to the front, get down on your knees, or sit here on the front row. And let's get right with the Lord. You got trials, you got some temptations. You need help with that. Come down here to the front, get down on your knees, and tell your God about it. You haven't been treating people like you should. You haven't been talking like you should. Just tell God about it. And let's be doers of the word this morning. Let's stand for Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the help that it is. As we take a look at the mirror, we find ourselves lacking in some areas. How we're dealing with trials and temptations, how we're dealing with our speech, how we're dealing with people that are less fortunate than us. So Lord, I pray that we draw closer to you. Well, thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, the piano's playing.